Hey, Nintendo fans and collectors, welcome to the Nintendo Collecting Podcast. I have two guests on with me today. One is Chris. Say hello, Chris. Hello. And the other one is Mike. Say hello, Mike. Hello. And these two individuals go back. Chris goes back to my elementary school days. Mike definitely met in high school. We love Zelda games. We talk about Zelda from time to time. You guys have checked into a few of the Zelda-thons as well in person. Mike, in particular, you've helped out with which games in the past for Zelda-thon? Uh, just Link to, the, Link to the Past. Yes, and Chris, did you ever help out with one of them? I know you came I, with you. I may have put some time into Link to the Past as well. That was one of my games when I was growing up. But uh, no, I missed it this year. But yeah, not, not a regular. Exactly. We might have another one, by the way, this summer instead of the winter. So we'll get into that. So this podcast will mostly just be about Zelda. At the end, we'll talk a little bit about the Switch in general and your reactions to pricing and things like that. But first of all, you guys watched the trailer from the presentation. What were your first initial impressions of that trailer? Mike, what about you? Um, for one thing, it definitely got me jacked up for the game. I haven't really played a Zelda game. And besides Link Between Worlds, that was the last one that I did play. Um, in terms of consoles, though, I, I definitely haven't played one in a little while, and this totally got me amped up for playing another Zelda, another main console Zelda game. Um, it was just everything about it is the music and, and all that stuff, and the whole production value of the trailer it really, really made me feel like, holy crap, I want to play a Zelda game right now. So that, that's really my first impression of that. I thought Link Between Worlds is fantastic on the 3DS as well. I think that's one of the best Zelda games, one of the best handheld Zelda games for sure. Oh, totally. I agree. I, I was totally immersed in that once I started playing that. Chris, what were your first impressions of the trailer? Well, it's, uh, it showed you what Zelda does best. It shows all the, the big the big uh, landscapes, all the wicked new weapons. It's got shows you you know a little teaser of what the new the new mechanics might be. Um, you know, it's just it it shows you everything that you want out of a Zelda game. So yeah, like Mike, this gets you amped up. Exactly. I thought it was one of the best parts of the presentation. They kept teasing the trailer and they left out mentioning Zelda the entire presentation until the very, very end. And then they had Reggie fils come on and he kind of suggested it. And then they went back to live and they finally show the trailer, of course. The big reveal with that trailer was that it's coming at launch March the 3rd, 2017. It's actually a month and a half away, so it's really close. First of all, what was your last main Zelda game? So, Mike, what was your last main Zelda game? Uh, main is in console? Uh, either or, really. Okay, yeah. The, the, so the last one I did play was Link Between Worlds. Uh, I am right now playing Majora's Mask on the 3DS because I think oh, I purchased awesome. that last Boxing Day. So yeah. it's been like an over a year since I've even turned it on. But uh, but actually, your Zelda-thon got me kind of thinking, okay, you know what? I kind of want to play Zelda again. I want to play some sort of adventure game like that. I wasn't going to fully commit to turning on my console again because currently my Wii is... Not really plugged in, but um, it will when you play a lot of other stuff too. So yeah, exactly. I mean, like, I have, well, admittedly, I haven't played like very many video games at all recently. But uh, but I definitely did during your Zeldathon. I had the Twitch feed up, and I also was also playing along on the 3DS as well. So yeah, um, and you mentioned Skyward Sword. You want to get back into? I do. Try that. Yeah, I do. So I, I do have that here with me, um, uh, and I do want to plug it in. Like I said, next week, fiance's gone for like five days, so I might just have to hunker down and fire it up. Yeah, what's your favorite Zelda game, Mike? It's still Ocarina of Time. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's the nostalgia of it. I just remember playing that so many times. It was one of the, I don't want to say one of the few Zelda games that had a huge replay value, because I think a good chunk of them do. Um, but it was long enough, but not too long enough that I could actually go through the entire thing, like not be bored at all. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, the first time through, if you're trying to 100%, it took so long. But Jordan, yeah. this time around, I think he beat it. He beat it sub-12 hours at the Zelda-thon. So he's starting to know what he... Like, you and I always used to hang out, and we'd play up until the Water Temple. And then, yeah, like, it was like, always the Water Temple, then we just quit. Because at that point, it'd be like 4 in the morning. And yeah, at that point, yeah. we didn't want to deal with the Water Temple. But uh, but yeah, no, totally. Like, just the replay value on it is just huge. Chris, what about you? What's your last Zelda, main Zelda game and your favorite Zelda game? Well, I, pl I played through Twilight Princess, uh, would have been a long time ago now, but was playing it through that craze, and I've, I've only got a few hours into uh, Skyward Sword. I do do hope to finish that one in time. Um, but yeah, there's not a whole lot of time for, for the, the one-player campaign-style games these days, right? So you gotta you got to find the time to sit down and play through it. Um, yeah. My favorite is just like everyone else, so Karina. It's the, it's the one that made all of the mechanics that you expect out of a Zelda game. It, it made that experience pretty much it was the first one that was sort of like that. And, you know, every, every game since is trying to mimic that and build on it. Absolutely. And that's what I feel like Breath of the Wild is trying to do. It's trying to build on that. Twilight Princess 
tried to do that, but I feel like it did it in a very lackluster way for me personally. A lot of people love Twilight Princess, and that's great. It just it felt dark and just really long and huge for the sake of being long and huge, and wasn't mm -hmm. always that interesting or appealing to me. But I feel I like that's a while. That too. Yeah, I think it was just very very dark. But yeah, I'm hoping something a little bit more. Like I do like the whole open world type thing that's coming up here. So that's that's got me something excited to play that. Yeah, absolutely. So let's take a look at the uh, uh, Link to the Past just there as well. I know, Mike, was your first game Link to the Past for Zelda? Uh, no, I actually, I think it was Link's Awakening. I think oh, it was yes. the very first one that I played. Uh, then it was Ocarina of Time. And then at that point, I fired up the uh, the SNES again. And then I, I somehow, I can't remember where I got Link to the Past from. I uh, either bought it at a store or just bought it off a friend and never gave it back. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, I think then I fired it up third. Yeah, and a lot of the times, like your first Zelda game is your favorite, and my first Zelda game was Ocarina of Time. That's probably why it's my favorite. Chris, was it your first as well? No, mine was Link to the Past. I oh, played crazy. that. Okay. Yeah, that was like the my parents got me a SNES for Christmas when we were six or seven, whatever year that came out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, with along with you know all the Mario games and uh, Link to the Past, because I guess it was that was a hot game at the time, and we I really had no idea what was going on, but I was happy as a you know happy as a pig in, in mud there playing around with it. So. Yeah, it it's a, awesome. It's a favorite, yeah. So we're just going to take a look at the trailer. Um, I'm going to pause it as we go through and everything. But the first thing I want to mainly focus on with Breath of the Wild, like the scope of this game and all the different locales look absolutely insane. So here, obviously, we're panning up. And this is like the first time we really, in my memory, one of the first times we're seeing tropics in a Zelda game. I don't remember seeing like tropical locations. Obviously, in Wind Waker, this kind of came up, but not quite in the same way with like the scope of this is one interconnected world that has everything. Mm -hmm. So here, like just this first image, obviously, obviously, I think Nintendo's trying to focus on look at all the different locales in this game. Not only are there things and elements of seasons, but it's just beautiful. Yeah, totally. Yeah, like that's the one we haven't really gotten the notion of seasons in many of the of the Zelda games. As far as I know, again, I'm you know a little ignorant on some of the newer ones. But uh, but yeah, if we could get something like that, you're going through seasons, ever changing weather. I think that'd be really cool. It would be. I mean, most of the main connected Zelda games, obviously, in Ocarina of Time, when you look at the main map, you know, in the north, if it's if it's colder in the south, like there's water. It just depends on where it is in the world map. So where it might be. Yeah, but you never really had this like you had a really hard transition from one terrain to another. There's really never really like a gradual transition, which I'm hoping something like this. Like you're actually seeing a difference in climate as you're moving through. Exactly. So I don't know if there'll actually be seasons like Oracle of Seasons, but I don't know if there'll actually be seasons in the game. I think it would be more logical that just, you know, if you're more north then maybe it's colder, if you're more south then maybe it's hot. And like you yep. said, gradual transitions in the landscape because yep. it's all connected. And this world's insanely massive. So this sand area, I think there was last Zelda game that I played through a lot of sand area. Like I do remember the uh, the spinner, which was kind of a cool item. And that was in Twilight, I think, as well. There's some sand in that with a Stalord boss. I'm trying to go back to that one. Just remember all the different Zelda games. But sand's always usually a main theme. But I think it's nice to see Tropics getting more of a focus as well. Yeah, for sure. So let's just yeah. keep going through this a little bit. And obviously, like, there's seals, there's foxes. This is the winter area, or the snow area, the winter area. <laughs> <laughs> the fox looks pretty cool. I think, the obviously, most of the game will be with forests. There's going to be a lot about that going on, so that'll be pretty unique. And these this species, I think, is the Korok. So they're making a return from Wind Waker, which makes a lot of people start to believe that this might be in the same timeline as Wind Waker, but that timeline is just a mess. Do you guys know about the three different timelines? Yeah, I vaguely know about them. I, I don't I don't really know them too in depth to really comment on it. But yeah, I know that there's a lot of confusing timelines and which which link we're looking at and things like that. So it's yeah, it's not something I've totally looked into. Yeah, Chris, yeah, do you have any idea about the timelines? No, I never played through Wind Waker, but I do know yeah, uh, the Zelda games in general are a, a bit of a jumbled mess with the, the timelines, yeah. I don't personally care if the game ever fits into the timeline. They're trying to shoehorn them in, but this yeah. has these Koroks were in Wind Waker, and that's like my main note, I think. We're also going to encounter the Deku tree later in this trailer. So this does have a little bit of spoilers, but the other thing that I think this is going to go to, like the scope of this game, obviously we here we have the Master Sword, but the scope of the game, like I'm just really excited to go through one game interconnected massive world. I feel like with the Switch, what Nintendo had to do was here are massive open areas that you can only experience really on the Switch, but you can take them and go. So here are massive experiences you can have in our system that you can play at home and you can play on the go, not just like really small pocket adventures that are like new Super Mario Bros or even other handheld games that they have just seem like yeah. segmented. This is like 
Skyrim, huge open worlds. Zelda, huge open world. Mario now, huge open worlds. Like, I'm really excited about that. I think that's what Nintendo's trying to appeal to. So do you guys like when Zelda car- compartmentalized? We kind of talked about that, but like in Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time, you just kind of, you know, went into a hole and come come up in a new section and all of a sudden there's snow. And you already mentioned you like the difference here. Yeah, um, exactly. I'm sorry, Chris, I interrupted you there, but I, yeah, I, I do like the whole transition type thing. It was just, you're right. It was just kind of, I'm in one climate and then I go into a hole and then all of a sudden there's snow and then I go in another place and then there's desert. It's like, yeah, I mean, it was cool back then, obviously, but now I think we can move forward from that and progress from that. Yeah, Absolutely. Chris, are you looking for more like open world games? Because that's what I've been desperate for, like Donkey Kong sixty four, Banjo Kazooie, and Super Mario sixty four. Like I miss open worlds. Yeah, well, yeah, they definitely they can't make the same Zelda game uh, over and over again, right? So they, they I think this is going to be a big, a big change to this one. Is is there, you get to you get to explore? Uh, you don't have to go in in sequence. You're not you're not uh, railroaded in this one. You get to go and and run around and and do what uh, what interests you, how you want to level up your character, sort of thing. Exactly. It really does feel like an RPG as well. But Skyward Sword felt segmented. You could fly around. Wind Waker, you had all the islands that were kind of segmented because of the water. And this is all connected, which is, looks really fantastic. So I'm excited for that. We talked about seasons already. Let's get into the uh, different races. So I'm just going to go back over to the pictures and find all the different races. We'll race through these amiibo a little bit. But the, the different races in this game. So Gorons are back, apparently. This guy obviously looks like a Goron. He looks mm-hmm. absolutely amazing. I, I really like the Gorons. I think normally there's the, what, Rutu, the Gorons. Like, they're kind of staples of the Zelda series. And the yeah, they're, they're some of my favorite, yeah. I love the Gorons. The uh, mask that you could turn into, Majora's Mask, was actually really cool with the Gorons as well. But I think, like, I'm not against having returning races. I do like when they have a mix, and it's obviously part of the Zelda lore, but this guy really does look like a Goron to me. I don't think he can be anything else. No, I don't think there's really any interpretation there. No, what do you think he's holding? I can't even. Is it a sword? Is it like? It looks like a hammer on the end, but it's like hammer, like yeah. So who knows? Maybe there's a yeah. There looks like there's some sort of blade in between. Looks like a I don't know, like a big a big axe maybe. Maybe something like that. Yeah, no, it's good goal. Yeah, something else on the end. And then uh, the other races that we'll get to. Let me just go to the next image. So let's talk about the ones that are returning. I think there was the. Calamity Ganon's back, of course. Maybe these are a little bit out of order, but this guy, this guy, I don't think he's part of the core. Like, I don't know if we've seen this race before. We have seen some bird races in Zelda before, but I, this guy's brand new. Did you guys, was he in the trailer? I can't even remember if he was in this trailer. He was shown off once. He was, yeah. Yeah, he was shown off once at some point. So this is kind of like the Ritos, R-I-T-O, I think, from Wind Waker. They were flying birds, but he looks like an advancement of that for sure, or a de-evolution of that. I can't tell. To be honest, I, he looks like he looks like Falcon from Star Fox. He looks a lot like Falcon <laughs> from Star Fox, actually. That's kind of cool. Falcons in this game, we have Slippy, but no one likes Slippy or Toxic. <laughs> <Yeah. levels. laughs> he has no screen time, but he's in the game. He's in yeah, the game. He's, you can find like, him. <laughs> he's somewhere in a cave on his own, just like everyone left him there. Something like that. So this race, if it's part of the Rito, 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 I don't know how to pronounce it, but that'd be kind of cool. I'd be okay with that. Uh, the Koroks, I think I have some images. Let me just fly through the Zelda ones. So actually, well, I, I found these images next. Let's just go to these ones. So these ones, I can't tell. Like, is this, do you think this is Zora's? I can't even, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'd say so. They got a trident. Like that's, that's <laughs> yeah, they got a trident and, and clearly a whale fin as a head. So yes. yeah, I think it's more, it's more just sort of an advanced, you know, the, yeah, an advanced form of the same sort of races. Yeah. Same this one in the trailer, this guy is like twice the height of Link, at least. This guy's massive. So he looks pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Which would make mm-hmm. sense in terms of like, like if you're thinking that was Azora. I mean, they were taller and bigger, right? So, yeah. I definitely want to try and find that moment in the trailer. Okay. So going back here a little bit, it's so fast in the trailer. But yeah, when he's standing beside Link, I think towards the end of this, we see a few of the other like races here. I'll kind of really quickly. Yeah. Some of them are brand new that we've never seen before, which obviously I really like. I like having different races. So here's one of the other Gorons, or I'm not sure if that's the same Goron, but obviously he looks like he's got some fur on him. He looks like he's in a cold climate. Yeah, which I guess they, but the Gorons were in cold climates in uh, Majora's Mask, right? I think in Gor- yeah, I think in Majora's Mask they were. In Ocarina yeah. of Time, they were just on the mountain. On the mountain, yeah. With mm-hmm. a volcano, which makes sense with the rocks. This really depends. And this, I, I think, like, what does this remind you of from Ocarina of Time? Uh, the Great Fairy. Yeah, absolutely. 
Like, I feel like this has to be a fairy. Maybe not. Maybe it's something else. But those fairies in Ocarina of Time look so ridiculous. They're so, like, pixelated or uh, blocky now yeah. like, going back. <laughs> like, obviously, that's, that's, why it's, that's why she's unrecognizable. It's the, uh, the resolution's too clear. Yeah, the resolution's way too clear. You can't <laughs> yeah, see what it is. Right. Uh, I think we're going to... This race, I have no idea who this is, obviously. This, does this remind you guys of anything from previous games? Yeah, mm, yeah looks right. like uh, Gerudo. <laughs> It kind of does look like a Gerudo. I yeah, like, I agree. Or Gerudo, or however you pronounce that. Yeah, Gerudo. Gerudo. Yeah. So there's obviously like a returning races and hopefully some new races, or at least they like thought about what they could do new. And I'm sure they're holding on to stuff. I'm sure this isn't everything because Nintendo wouldn't want to show everything off before the game comes out. So this pan shot, even like, the fact that we're below this character obviously shows like the size of him, but I do think we get the scale and scope. I'm trying to pause on that one figure right there. So let me go back to that right here i think that looks like another zora but I, I can't tell for sure yeah you can you can kind of see like the yeah. again the, the whale fin thing and on their head so yeah blue jewelry and things like that and then the bird that we were talking about oh this guy here so look on the right on the right of the screen here you can kind of see maybe a leg or at least an appendage of another character I'm, do you remember that guy uh oh who was his name the king the zora king that barely moved who was like we we, yeah. well, was that his I name? Think that was just, yeah, it was just King Zora. Yeah, King Zora. Yeah, I'm wondering if on the right, the that's like a new King Zora, even bigger, yeah, even bigger. Yeah. <laughs> more stuck to his chair, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> more annoying to try yeah, and move more, out. More annoying sounds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, can't move at all. Uh, so I think the races could be really interesting. Um, beyond that, we're obviously going to all the different items in the game that I don't know how many of them are shown off in this trailer in particular, but there's. Obviously, we have all the staple items of the series that are in every Zelda game. So you have like the bow, but let's go to the sail for a moment. So let me just try and bring up that uh, for a second here. So in the trailer, yeah, you can see his bow and arrow a few shots here. Mm -hmm. Let me go back a little bit. So the bow and arrow. So what's back with this is you do get the bow, you get the arrow, but it, it has been noted that your items will break in this game. Yeah, no, I read about that. I thought that was interesting. Definitely a different take on, uh, on the weapons, things you get. I don't know if that'll be the case of the bow. Maybe we'll get like the hero's bow or something like that later on. But there is fire arrows, I think. There's bomb arrows as well. You would assume there's going to be light arrows. There's always light arrows. Always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or even ice arrows or things like that. See this? Uh, the shield, actually. Shields, apparently early in the game when you can't find a shield, you can use a pot lid, like the lid from cooking. Oh, okay. All right. So that's something that not many people have like seen before. Like, Do you guys think the the normal shields will be back like the mirror shield they they'll probably bring a couple of them back it, it, you know there's always a balance between how many weapons they want to bring back and keep them and you know just duplicate over again they may just yeah. have slight variations right depending on how the the gameplay mechanics work yeah absolutely or even the hylian shield like i feel like that has to be back of it has to yeah. be it's the master swords there it's got it gotta exactly be. yeah it's kind of like the master sword it's the, it's the main one of the main shields that you have to use right so. yeah throughout the like it'll be there, but I don't think that those won't break. I won't expect those will actually break. But and the fact that you can climb is kind of cool. In Zelda, Skyward Sword, you had a stamina meter, so in this you kind of have a stamina meter as well. But you can actually climb, eat food, and then keep climbing. Yeah, I was just gonna say. I remember reading about that. You can you can eat food, and it's it's a lot about recharging. So you're like you're right. It's more. It is a lot like an RPG in that sense. Yeah, and here we have the scope of the game a bit more. I'm trying to get to where the paraglider is. So now that horses are on screen, let's just talk about the horses for a moment, just to get into that. I know it's not really related to items, but let's take a break from that for a moment. There are horses in this game. I don't know if Epona will be back, but in other trailers that they showed after with this, and maybe not trailers, but gameplay videos, there was a staple, and Link was holding up to like six horses, and the horses had different stats, and you could name the horses and everything in the stable. So this is really, I think, adding to the RPG experience of this game, but would you guys want to see Epona back? Uh, yeah, that's the it, you know it's one of the characters that uh, you gotta you gotta draw back on some old classics, right? De again, it depends how many times they're they're dipping into the old well, right? But uh, that would be a good one, a good a good fan uh, favor there to uh, throw a, throw a opponent back into the game. Yeah, or even like at some point you have to unlock it or free opponent or something like that, kind of like you had to do in Ocarina of Time. Even if you if you can name the horses, just name the horse opponent. Then it really, <laughs> yeah, maybe. that's all you have. To yeah, I was gonna say like maybe they'll have some sort of Easter egg where like if you name one of the horses Epona and like it grows up if it's younger, maybe it grows into looking exactly like Epona should or something like that. I don't know. 
Yeah, yeah just drawing idea. parallels from the old, because maybe this is 100 years in the future. I don't know. But yeah, just drawing parallels in that sense. Yeah, which would be cool. I like the idea of maybe you could have a horse that's much faster, but doesn't have the greatest stamina. So it depends on what you want to do in the game. But apparently you might also be able to like go to the horse section of the menu and you have six different buttons that you can click to call on the horse wherever you are in the wild. And that horse will come. And then you can ride that horse. That'd I think cool. that would be really cool. Yeah, that'd be cool. If this world is huge, obviously going downhill is easy because you just get out the paraglider. But if it's massive and you need to go uphill, I think being able to call on any horse at any given time is really important too. Yeah, for sure. I think that'd be really interesting. So the horse looked great. I'm excited about that. I'm just waiting for the paraglider moments. I thought maybe that already occurred in the trailer, but I think it was, it was in the back when you're trying to, uh, when you're trying to click on the Zoras. Oh, was it really? Okay. Yeah, so we'll go back to that moment and see exactly where it is. The paraglider I'm a fan of. I think it's just crazy that you can jump off at any moment and you can just use the paraglider. Which yeah, these are all the all the sweet new yeah, items. Paraglider, paraglider. Which I just passed over twice, but we'll get back to that. <laughs> the paraglider, yeah, this. So the first time I saw this, I was like, this is really cool. Like the fact that you can paraglide, you can go out of paragliding, get out your fire arrow or bomb arrow or whatever, shoot an enemy, and then go back onto your parasailing as you go is really fantastic. I think that looks really cool. It opens up like a world of possibilities too, in terms of like hidden things, right? You know, maybe you need to paraglide somewhere and need to shoot something with a fire arrow in a certain spot as you're gliding, and then it opens up a new area or something like that. It yeah. opens a whole world of possibilities. That'd be insane. That'd be really cool. There yeah, are others. A, yeah, so those are, these are always my favorite part of the dungeons when you get a new item, and then you have to figure out how you're supposed to use that item to get to the next part of the dungeon. Yeah. So just to be able to use these in an open world, yeah, like Mike said, the amount of of hidden content that you can get to with you know combining two or more of the items that you find would be pretty un unreal most of the zelda games usually when you're in the open world you can see like while you're there early you can see like oh i need the hook shots i can't get that yet but obviously the hook shots are coming at some point in the game yeah. so I, I am wondering if dungeons will be completely designed around one item like they usually are or if it's just like at that point you probably have most of the items and go for it any way you want to solve this puzzle which yeah. be I would be more interested in rather than this whole dungeons designed around this one item again. Yeah, yeah it yeah. does get tired. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like it's very formulaic, right? You you'd like something a little more open that lets you to do whatever you want to get to the end. Exactly. Yeah, it would be much better. And it's it almost becomes like a crutch of just the way to solve a puzzle. It'd be like the same item every time. So I feel like more recent Zelda games have you changing items constantly, which I do really enjoy. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to those other items that we kind of saw briefly. So we're just going to go... Uh, it was past Calamity Ganon, which we will get to in a moment. But after that, we do have the two new items. Oh, that's a really cool enemy, actually, these massive bosses. So this one right here is called, I think, Cryonis. I think it's what it's called. So you're actually creating these blocks of ice with your item that you can step on. And right here, this does this look like water? It must be water. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. It, I first thought it was some sand. In it. Yeah, it looks it looks sort of sandy, but you can see some reflections of the sun in it, so it looks yeah. like it could be the surface of water. So this is pretty cool, like creating a cube out of nothing that you can actually like walk on. I think that's kind of interesting. They should be a little bit slippery like they were in previous Zelda games, but I think that's a really neat item. It depends how they use it, but I think that's really interesting. For sure. And let's go to the next one, which is like right after this, I think. So this is, you can look at what Link's wearing. Link's wearing like steel armor, almost like yeah, the, right. in Ocarina of Time, uh, he was wearing that red tunic, right? To, yeah. mm -hmm. to repel fire. So this really looks like the RPG. It looks like he's almost wearing like stone boots and not stone, but steel everything right now. Using a shield to actually prevent the fire from burning him while walking towards it. That is pretty cool. That's almost like a Ganon-like boss. Yeah, character <laughs> boss or something like that. So this one's called the Magnesis. So this one is brand new to the Zelda series. Anything that looks metallic, metal, or something like that, you can actually move. And he can hold up the item and like wave it back and forth in front of items, enemies, or bosses and actually damage them. But you, obviously at that point, you're very vulnerable for attacks. Yeah. But Yeah, it looks like he's like force lifting, right? Like he can sort of draw it in and push it out and stuff like that, right? I like that idea. Yeah, I like that analogy. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. He's using force lift as a Jedi, basically, at this moment. Exactly which looks really cool. I think this is interesting because I saw one trailer, one moment of the game where there was like a chest under the water and you didn't know it was there really. Or maybe you could see it at some point. You're like, how do I get on? How do I get to that? How do I open it up? And you had to use the magnesis to actually bring it up and then put it wherever you want to open it. Nice. Mm -hmm. 
So I think obviously they'll have to program into the game all of these things you can move and certain things you can't because I'm sure there are some items that you could probably like if there's a sword over there, maybe you could just like pick up the sword. But if it's the master sword, you shouldn't just like come here, master sword and it, like yeah, flies exactly. to you. That's something you actually have to go and pick up. Yeah. So they have to program that interesting. But I could see a lot of puzzles coming out of this. That'll be really cool. Totally. I think that could be a lot of fun. Uh, here we have the bomb arrows. So obviously, like throughout the land, there's a lot of little moments or areas that they have set up for you with crates because you know if you're a baddie in the game, you've got to have a crate that's explosive standing right next to you, <laughs> properly labeled, of course, for exactly. health yeah. and safety. Yeah, Please absolutely. Shoot here. Yeah, and then we'll see what happens because no one will know. But obviously, that's that's fun. That looks really cool. Uh, this is called the Sheikah slate. But let's be honest, this is just a tablet. So Link's got a tablet. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Link having a tablet in 2017? It's got that sweet Note Seven. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're right. It's a Zelda. It's a Zelda style Pokedex. Yeah, that's basically what it is. Yeah. I wonder. Like, usually he has some sort of a companion character, and there might still be that in this game. Or I'm wondering if it'll just be done through the Sheikah slate, and maybe it'll, like talk to you or suggest well, things. That's it. Yep. Would you guys want to see a return of someone like Fi or Fee? I don't know how to pronounce it. Or Navi? Would you guys like to see the partner return? I find them so irritating and hard to navigate, to be completely honest. They they don't usually offer anything helpful. And like in both both Navi and she, which one was she in? Was she the uh, Twilight Princess? Which one was Twilight Princess? Twilight Princess is the one on the GameCube and the Wii. Which, what was your, what was your, your uh, companion? companion? Fi. Fi is Fi, the other yeah. one. F Fi. 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 Fee, five, and then there's, there's another one in, in Skyward Sword where the where the sword helps you out, right? Yeah, that's five. That's five. Five. They they're, they're just in, I don't know. In, I, I never find them really all that helpful, and they're they're a pain to navigate. They're always a a weird sort of a easily accidentally hit button and stuff like that. So. <laughs> yeah, in Twilight Princess it was Midna, and uh, they could always be annoying because sometimes when you're trying to talk to like Midna, for example, it was like, oh, I need help in this area, and then they say something that's not even like relevant no. whatsoever. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I would say like nine times out of ten, they they give you completely irrelevant information. So, so it, maybe if Nintendo was listening, maybe they're like, oh, let's do away with that annoying partner, and here's the Sheikah slate that looks like a Nintendo Switch console that is a tablet, really, that just helps you out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, if I it mean, was, if it could be somewhat, if if it could be used in a different way than sort of something that's there just to poke if you're stuck, if it could, you know, if it could give you additional information that you could just reference occasionally instead of having to go through like the whole dialogue conversation that that the previous sort of assistants have been. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. I think. I think feel like getting rid of the sidekick would be a good thing that really allows you to stand out on your own more and like if they have a character like jabora gabora is that pronounced correctly mike i think it's kabora uh, gabora kabora gabora yeah, yeah. Uh, something like that where it just like helps you out or says something every once in a while like that's fine i'm, I'm okay with that but yeah he meets you at the front of a front of an area or something like that and he says okay there you've got this to look forward to now go forth and figure it out yeah and mm -hmm. do things like that so the last like items that i want to talk about before we transition to towns is just there are a lot of different items that you can get in this game in wind waker i think was the first time that you could like pick up an enemy's weapon and use it against them which was kind of cool yeah. but this time around there's like there's spears axes pitchforks bows clubs all that stuff's available to you and it will break over time and even pot lids you can use you can cook you can, I think, craft some items as well at some point, which is kind of cool. So I'm looking forward to all those being in this. I really feel like they're being inspired by Skyrim and different games like that, which I'm fine yeah. with. Yeah, no, I kind of like the idea of that, that you can cook and you know make yourself a little more healthy and powerful and things like that. But I just don't know. I don't want it to hold Link back or anything like that. Like you're constantly yeah. having to like cook for yourself so you have the energy to move forward in the next part of the game I, I, I hope it doesn't get to that point just a little bit it's more of like a niche thing but yeah yeah i mean if you could cook very specific things that are hard to get and they like help heal you or things yeah. like that but if it's yeah. like if, if i want to climb that massive wall and i need to then i'll just bring some food with me and like that'd be okay but maybe yeah. i don't have to yeah. cook it if i don't want to i could just eat wild mushrooms or whatever it is yeah exactly but if it's like necessary for survival it's not really something i'd be interested in but i don't think nintendo would go down that route yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm hoping it's it lands somewhere between the traditional Zelda game and like Skyrim, one of the bigger RPGs where it's not you don't have to grind your way to be a, you know a high enough level to move on. You can you can still just sort of go from one one level to the next or, or one shrine, I guess in this case, and not have to sit there and grind through and oh I got to cook for I got to spend two days of gameplay cooking 
so that I can move along, right? <laughs> yeah, that will not be this game. I feel like yeah. Skyward Sword started to touch on those kind of things, but I felt like it wasn't fully implemented well, and I felt like if they do it a little bit better in this game, I'll be happier, because I feel like it was shoehorned in a bit too much in Skyward Sword. But I want you guys yeah. to look at this one building here in this town that we're about to talk about. On the right-hand side, you have like a green, a blue, and a red little vial of liquid. What does that remind you guys of? Good find. Those are the uh, the pendants. Oh, it yeah, could be the pendants. Yeah. yeah. If they're in these vials, though, they really remind me of maybe I can make some potions. Or oh, something. potions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it reminds yeah. Me. yeah, that's right. Yeah. The so maybe this is magic and things. Strength, yeah. Strength and magic and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe like stronger defense and health and all that kind of stuff. So I think I feel like that's going to be with obviously there's going to be bottles in this game or different containers that you can use. And I feel like this is in this town anyways. You're going to be able to do different stuff. So let's talk about towns next. So towns in Zelda, I feel like they've always had a real big importance. Sometimes even a dungeon has been hidden or a mini dungeon has been hidden like inside of a town, which I really liked in that was Kakariko Village, was it? In Ocarina of Time? Yep. Yeah, so that was really cool. So this town actually, like just looking at this, there's a lot of different scale to this. I feel like there's a lot of different heights that you can go throughout this town. Like that one building all the way in the top left, that's way up there. Yeah, yeah, totally. That looks really cool. Yeah. I've, I've always I've always loved like the notion of towns in, in these Zelda games. Like I think Kakariko Village, one of them. Uh, I, one thing I really remember from Wind Waker, because I, I didn't play all the way through that, but I remember Windfall Island. I, I really enjoyed that town because there was so much to do. Windfall Island's my favorite island, I think, in that yep. game. You're yeah. right. And as you investigate the island more, you realize there's so many things hidden there's everywhere. So much stuff. Yeah, you could spend hours on Windfall. Oh, I, yeah, I still do. And in the Zelda phone, I wanted to the whole time as well. But this, a lot of people were concerned because when they first saw the first few trailers of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, they were just saying, towns look tiny or they don't look really important. But with this, I feel like they emphasize this more. There's a lot of people. There's a lot going on in this town and a lot of buildings, actually. So I feel like towns will hopefully be more important. You you can stop, obviously, and maybe like heal or rest and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We'll see which is kind of neat. So I, I'm hoping that there's a few neat towns that kind of segment up this massive world. That'll be really interesting. Uh, here's another one. And this looks entirely different. This looks like a sand town or something like that with, I can't tell. Are those, is that like water cascading off that left hand massive creation? Could also yeah, be it looks sand. like water to me. Could yeah. be sand, but yeah. Looks Could like just be sand, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Perhaps I just sand like cascading down or something like that. That looks really cool. So this this town looks really awesome. Maybe it's not a town at all, but I mean I do see people in this. So we'll see what the towns are like. But yeah, I hope there's a few major towns uh, like Kakariko Village. That'll be really cool. So next up, let's talk about the villains in this game or the different evil characters. So here we have a lot of guardians, obviously going around the town. Uh, you can sail. So this one. While we're here, I just need to mention this this tree, this massive tree, obviously, with Koroks all over it. Mm. This reminds us of what? It's our boy. Yeah, Deku. it's got to be. It, obviously, this is the great Deku tree. So this brings us back to it's our so many. It's our boy. <laughs> it's our boy. Yeah, he's, he's our boy, this massive, monstrous tree that looks like he's very overrun. In yeah, Wind Waker, huge. you... You kind of replanted these trees and all these seeds with the uh, with the Koroks, and I'm wondering if this is like maybe the result of that. It could be. I don't know where this is in the timeline. This could be before, or after, or not even related to Wind Waker. But I don't know if 100 years is enough time for this monstrous tree to grow. Pro probably it is, but yeah, 100 years. Is world, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anything's possible. Anything's possible. So it's really nice to see this guy back. Obviously, he's a staple favorite. <laughs> Everyone loves him. Great sad moment from Ocarina of Time that I won't mention right now, but that's a really good moment. So more uh, evil in this game. So the Guardians are there. We're going to talk about the flower in a second. I just want to go back to uh, the Guardians that are kind of like, this looks like this Guardian's being awoken by something. And we're going to get to Zelda as well in a moment. But So all these Guardians everywhere that are obviously like destroying the landscape. And that kind of drives the story of this game, the Guardians. And this looks like a monstrous Guardian in the background. Some sort of mechanical thing. Yeah. So I'm going to try and find, uh, I'll find Calamity Ganon. And we're going to go back to him because he looks really cool. And we have to obviously discuss Calamity Ganon for a moment. So there's Calamity Ganon in all of his glory. So Calamity Ganon is going to be a big part of the story. It looks like he's circling around, obviously, the castle. Yep. And this this is a lot like Ocarina of Time, Mike, you were saying. Yeah. So with Ocarina of Time, really when you were an adult with that castle, I think this gets the same vibe. Yeah, no, I think you're right. 
It really does. That. I know in Link to the Past, there was the dark world and the light, like the normal light world or whatever. That kind of changed. So maybe this game will start off being okay. And I'm not sure how this game will start. But if it starts off, there's not that much going wrong. And then Calamity again and comes and kind of drives the story. That'll be pretty interesting. Do you like the idea of him being this, like, it's almost like he's a spirit, like in a lot of other different stories where he just maintains a spirit. I'm thinking of like Harry Potter and Voldemort, how he still has like yeah. his spirit. Yeah, because it was my understanding that they kind of, that Ganon was kind of locked away a hundred years ago or something like that in the castle, unable to escape. So I, I have a feeling he'll be there like right from the beginning and not somebody that kind of shows up midway through and starts terrorizing. Maybe he'll just get more powerful as the game goes on, but he's always there in the background. Yeah, and they are calling him Ganon, so there's no question. It's not like they're yeah. holding on to it. Do you think Ganondorf will be in the game, the human form? That might be what they're alluding to. Maybe that's where it, where it all ends up. Yeah. But it's hard to say for sure. It usually does. Like, Would you guys have a problem if the final boss fight again is Ganon? Ganondorf? No. No, no, no. It's like, no. It's like fighting Bowser and Mario. Just exactly. It's, it you're right. Exactly. It's like Bowser. He's got to be there in some capacity as the final boss. Yeah, he's not in every single Zelda game, but yeah. I feel like he should be there. That's, yep. He's really important. So he looks really cool, and we've got all these shrines all over the place that's kind of showing off as well that you'll have to go through in the game. This this looks awesome. This uh, shot here almost reminds me of, like, Lion King Africa, the plains and all that, which looks really cool. But Calamity Ganon in the background and everything else going wrong, and the Guardians look really cool. This boss here, both of these bosses here, look absolutely awesome and monstrous. I don't know if I can get a better shot of this guy. So we'll try and go back slightly. Of him coming out of the ground. This reminds me a lot of an enemy from uh, Wind Waker. One oh, of the big okay. bosses. So it looks it very similar to it. Valmegia. That's true. Yeah, it does. So some of these fights look absolutely outrageously good. I think the scale of these bosses, it's not quite Shadow of the Colossus, but there's there's one of them in this trailer that is absolutely insanely monstrous towards the end of the trailer that I'll try and get to. That. I'm not sure if you'll be fighting, but this, this there's two oh, of them here yeah. that are huge. This guy. Now, I think... Slight spoilers, but my thought would be that this is a giant elephant. I've seen the map in the Master Edition, and this might be a giant elephant that is somehow mechanical as well. Uh, the red usually denotes evil, and you can see red obviously going up this guy. There was also the giant bird that was shown off in, I'm not sure this trailer or the other trailer, that was blue and then went to red. And we're wondering if that was good and then became evil. So I think this guy is obviously, he's, I assume we have to fight him. He looks cool. He looks like he's insanely monstrous. Uh, what yeah, was the I other one? How you would fight him, but hey. Well, if you think of Shadow of the Colossus and those kinds of games, like you yeah, have to climb up on their backs. Tons of guardians taking over here for a second, and I'm just waiting for that other monstrous individual that maybe we'll see on screen. That's another huge one. I think there's just massive fights that we're gonna have to have at some point with these characters. Gonna uh, I'm going. I'm gonna go back to the other one if I can find it, just to show you. So this is after the Deku tree. So I think if there's only four dungeons, let's get into the dungeons conversation for a second. So how many dungeons would be upsetting to you? How many is not enough in a Zelda game? To me, four. Personally, four is probably okay. Um, for someone that doesn't get... I, I don't have a whole lot of time consecutively to, to grind through these, these massive games. So being able to sort of bite off some smaller ones at a time, or if I do decide that I'm going to sit down for an extended session that I could try to take on one of the bigger ones, probably a little bit more welcoming. I'm wondering yeah. if that's what the Nintendo's finding that these, the, you know, put having nine large dungeons or something like that in a game is a little bit overwhelming. Yeah. Like Wind Waker, I felt like could have used one more that they then just made the end game much longer by doing like side quests with the Triforce pieces and everything like that. And then uh, Skyward Sword, Twilight Princess, Twilight Princess had almost too many. Yeah. So Majora's Mask had four main ones, right? I think it, there was only the four main ones. And then one additional one, kind of. So the, the thought process that I've heard in this game is that there's a lot of shrines. There's like 100 shrines. And then maybe there's only going to be like four main dungeons and then one final dungeon. So maybe like five. But if they have tons of shrines that feel like mini dungeons all over the place that take like 20 minutes, half an hour to beat, I'm absolutely happy with that. That'd be fine yeah. with me. Yeah, I've got no problems with that. Yeah, I think it's super satisfying. Yeah, yeah, there needs to be some semblance of like the big dungeon. Yes, just to make you make you feel like you've hit some sort of big milestone within the game. But exactly. smaller dungeons throughout, totally, totally yeah, for that. The dungeons to me, like I enjoy Dungeons and Zelda games, but I really almost enjoy more the time in between dungeons when there was all the side quests, the towns to go visit, and the experience of the game. I liked those almost more than the dungeons. So I'm fine with 
100 or however many mini shrines and then maybe like four or five major dungeons i'm okay with that for sure and this giant beast this looks cool if we have to fight this guy that'd be amazing but this is when they, they're kind of saying 100 years ago so let's get into the, like the story of 100 years ago what do you think happened 100 years ago in this timeline or whatever's going on any thoughts any ideas I think that's got to be Calamity Ganon, right? Like, that's got to be it. Yeah, like, maybe he showed up or something or whatever, like that. Yeah, or, or however he was imprisoned in the, the castle or something like that. I think that's what they're alluding to, is this is... What happened 100 years ago is what you're going to have to solve now, right? Yeah. That's yeah, I'm sorry if there's some sort of link to the past, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, I'm just I'm just wondering if there's like it, there actually is some sort of link to some sort of a previous link or a previous game where we at the end we beat Ganon, locked him away, and then all of a sudden he's now here, hundred years later, about ready to wreak havoc on everybody else again. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. This looks like an interesting shot. I didn't really take note, but like if this is a town that you can visit in the game and it's just being overrun like this, I'm wondering if this is actually a town in the game or if this is just like a. Uh, Maybe a video that you watch during the game flashback. or something like that. Yeah, a yeah. flashback, a cutscene, a cutscene of some sort. We'll yeah. see at that moment. So yeah, 100 years ago is obviously hopefully tying into another Zelda game, but it doesn't always have to. But usually it does. Uh, next up, let's get to the relationship between Link and Zelda because in Skyward Sword, for the first time for me, I felt like they had a really interesting relationship that I cared about for the first time. And you guys need to experience more Skyward Sword to get into that, but. I'm all for Link and Zelda having like a close relationship in this game. What do you think of uh, her design? A lot of people, a lot of people have been commenting that they really like her hair, but aspects of her, some people are really happy with, some people aren't. I I love this character design. I think this looks very real to me in this world. I believe this character, and I think that she would obviously be friends or at least have a relationship like with Link in some regard. I think that's really cool. For sure, yeah. It looks like they sort of dressed her down a little bit and dressed Link up a little bit more than usual, and uh, they sort of they seem to be existing on the same sort of plane instead That's of a really just good a, point. Yeah, the you're green right. tunic it's in the the fancy dress of Zelda, like the, the, the same tunic status, status almost. Yeah, yeah. Maybe she's not quite the princess. There in this trailer, it also says, "Can you save my daughter? Will you save my daughter?" Which I hope is referring to Zelda, but we don't know because in Wind Waker, of course, he had to. He was asked to save so many different daughters. who are all being captured. But I, I really like this depiction, and I think you're right. I feel like she looks the same, or almost on the same plane of Link. You can yeah. see the Triforce right there, obviously, on her uh, jewelry, on her vest of her dress, I guess, yep. not jewelry. So clearly, they're still bringing that back, as, well, as always. Which I think they have to. Yeah, absolutely, yep. they have to. Here's some characters who, I don't even know what this character is on the right. I can't even, it looks like those are tusks. I can't make out what this guy is, obviously, quite <laughs> yet. I mean, they look like tusks, right? Like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah no. I think... The red-haired individual we've seen before, but uh, we're going to get back to Zelda and Link right here. So this was a huge moment from this trailer where they're kind of saying, like, everything and all the work that we've done is completely being useless. And you can see, like, they're pretty torn up here. They look like they were obviously, like, outrunning maybe the Guardian, setting everything on fire. She's crying. And did you, like, did you guys actually get the feels from this moment in the trailer? Well, I'd say yeah, it's pretty powerful for sure. It's, uh, it like, yeah, like you said, it's the the... Uh, relationship that you don't typically get in the, the older Zelda games that they're, they're definitely drawing on again here. Yeah, it's yeah. a new level of emotion, really. Right. But both of them, it's like you kind of meet, or sorry, the past Zelda games, you kind of meet Zelda, and it's like, okay, I need your help, and then you don't really see her too much. You right. see her in little instances here and there, but it seems like she's playing much more of a prevalent role. Yeah, here she's obviously dressed up a little bit more. Maybe this is a bit more mid-game or earliest game before she goes undercover, or who knows, she dresses into this. But I think you're right. I think giving them giving their relationship more of a value to the player is really important, which I'm really excited for. It's called The Legend of Zelda. It's not yeah, called The Legend of Link. Game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like the whole game's like, it's hey, it's named after me, by the way, Link. It's like, what? Why? Like, why isn't this my legend? Like, I, I've mm -hmm. seen that funny video before, so... I'm really excited to watch their relationship grow. I think that'll be really interesting dynamic in this. Uh, beyond that, I just want to talk about the other few moments here from the end of the trailer when you obviously see the logo for the game come up. And in the logo, you have this sword, first of all, that has rust on it. It's the Master Sword, so they said 100 years ago. If the Master Sword has rust on it, it was obviously used 100 years ago by a Link. Yep. You have to assume. This flower, though, I have no idea what to think about this flower that grows. And apparently it's going to be really important. 
any thoughts on that flower? And it was earlier in the trailer. If I can find that flower specifically, I'll try and see if I can hunt for it. But any ideas what on earth? I mean, it's Breath of the Wild, yes, but I think there's going to be more more control over not control more more to play at, at play for the seasons than uh, than you might think. And I think that's sort of why the flowers uh, shown there is a like spring as one of the seasons. I it's think like that re- you might. I think you might be able to control more of your environment, more like the way Ocarina controlled time. You could oh, okay. be able to manipulate oh, okay. the, right. the weather or something like that a little bit more, or or the seasons. That would you know? be really cool. Yeah. So no, here's what? that. Here's that flower that's okay, yeah. really utterly important that they're saying that I I just can't think of what it could be, but that's a good idea. Mike, do yeah. you have any ideas? Yeah. One one thing I, I I was I was doing a little bit of reading before this, and one thing that somebody brought up, which I you know it it kind of does make sense. It's an old master sword. Um, and the forest where you get the master sword and a link to the past had that had the master sword in the in its pedestal, but and flowers around it. So I think that, that they were trying to say that there was going to be some sort of parallel between that and 100 years ago may may have been the timeline of Link to the Past. Right. Uh, there'd be some sort of homage to that. And maybe like when these flowers bloom, like the heroes returning or something like that. Like I don't know. Yeah, and, and like you know, Hyrule at this point is in ruins, so maybe this is like a symbol of it coming back and links the person there to be the hero and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the covers of most of the Zelda games, like for going back to the other Zelda games, like Ocarina of Time has the Master Sword and the Hyrulean Shield, and then Majora's Mask has the Majora's Mask on it, Wind Waker has the boat, so with like Twilight Princess, it has both Link and Wolf Link on it, Skyward Sword is swords up, like obviously the meaning that is there, Nintendo's trying to show us something, but I'm excited to find out what that means, because there could yep. be a lot. There could be a lot there at some point. So next up, uh, just before we finish this, I just want to mention how there are Amiibo coming out for this game. So there's a lot of Amiibo actually announced, which look kind of interesting that we're going to get to really quickly right now. Are you guys interested in these at all, like even to put on your desk at work? Depends how they if the, they do a good job with the artwork. This new Link looks really cool. He's definitely a, sort of a new take on the character. So that the one on the left there looks pretty sick. Yeah, that one looks really cool. Uh, just getting you a better image of him right there. Nice. So that looks yeah. really awesome. Uh, you can see the Sheikah tablet kind of on his around him as well. And I mean, oh, it, yeah. looks like, yeah. it looks like obviously he's got a sword and shield. That, that's not the master sword, not the shield that we're used to. And the bow looks pretty cool. And that's using some of the mechanical arrows that I don't exactly know how they'll work quite yet in the game. But that looks really awesome. The uh, This one's Link on horseback. I don't love that stand. I think the stand looks kind of ridiculous, but the horse looks gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. The horse looks gorgeous. I like the fact that he's got the hood hood on and things like that. But you're right. The the stand looks kind of yeah. Wish out of they place. Could have figured out how to balance that properly without yeah. putting the cheater stand in there. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's true. At least it's not the yellow stand that Link was on for the uh, Smash Bros. one because that one looked abysmal. Now that guardian in the middle, that one is supposed to be the first posable amiibo figure. It's supposed to cost a bit more instead of fifteen dollars, like twenty dollars or something like that. Okay. The arms are all supposed to be like adjustable. So cool. I'm. I'm waiting to see how that actually looks like when they actually uh, when they release it because that one looks really awesome. Actually, they could pose that. That'd be cool. And then they just announced these two. So this is Zelda and a Bokoblin. Zelda, obviously, I think that's really neat. I love that character design too. But what do you guys think of a Bok- Bokoblin or Bokoblin or however you pronounce it? How do you think of those? Like they got their own their own amiibo figure. That's kind of weird. Yeah, it almost so it's would... almost just like a pet sort of thing. Like you know, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You just want to you like how they look, so you buy an amiibo of them. <laughs> yeah, so why not? Just, just here unless you go. They're, unless they're a more important character, then we're chalking them up to be. Yeah, but... that's yeah. Maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe at some point, it looks like a Dobby the House Elf kind of exactly, thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. So I think these amiibo they do look really cool. Uh, the Guardian, the Guardian especially, I think that's very unique that it hasn't really been done before. It's monstrous, by the way, as well. So there's going to be five amiibo figures. Wolf Link, you can also scan in, and Wolf Link will actually be your partner. He'll run alongside you for that day. But I think you can only scan them in once per day on your uh, game, both the Wii U and on the Switch, because it works on both. And then, yeah, Wolf Link will run beside you. He'll go attack enemies and everything, but he has health as well, and he can he can die eventually. So that's kind of cool to exist in the game. So that's how Amiibo mm-hmm. will kind of work. The other uh, figurines for Amiibo, just going to their website, actually, really quickly. So there are other Amiibo figures. There's the Wolf Link one that I was just kind of mentioning on the Nintendo Zelda website. Uh, the Nintendo Switch features and things like that i did have it up but if you it depends on which amiibo you tap in but if you tap in certain ones then they actually give you like meats or they give you herbs or flowers or things like that so these are the five that they're coming out with here on the website and uh the other ones scan in as well that you could use 
to celebrate the classics. They'll all be done in a different way. So they're, they're going to work on the game just to note that too. And there's some additional ones coming out. Uh, let's also look at what else do I have here? So there's some other references to older Zelda games. It's kind of interesting. Like the old man, they're showing that there's an old man here. He's not giving you a sword. He's just giving you like his torches and baked apples. Thanks. Thanks guy. Mm. Great. <laughs> That's not quite the same thing. Uh, spec it says spectacle rocks back as well, which is kind of interesting. It looks like a pair of eyeglasses. Sure, sure. Let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, raft riding is back from the original Legend of Zelda. Which is oh yeah, cool. yeah. The skull hideout. I think this is the nicest uh, kind of throwback to the original Zelda game that they have. This that your enemies sure. kind of turned into a fortress. That's kind of neat, just to mention oh, as cool. well. So there's some nice stuff there. Uh, then we're getting into the other images that I have. Uh, lastly, that we're talking about is the different variations that you can actually buy this game. And the versions are crazy. So here you're looking at the Master Edition. This thing costs 130 US dollars. If you're in Canada, it's $200. So this, you get the game. Woo. You get the game that costs 60 US dollars normally. You get the soundtrack. You get this collectible coin that was really popular, given away at a previous event. You get this... Uh, Nintendo Switch carrying case, actually. You can hold your games in that I'm more excited about than I should have been, I think. So this carrying case I'll actually use, which I, I didn't notice it at first. I kind of looked past it because I was I was so set on this Master Sword. What do you guys think of this Master Sword, at least? That is a pretty sick Master Sword. Yeah, is it, it is pretty the, cool. The case though, is that for the is it for games or is it for the actual Switch, like the tablet? Oh, that's for the tablet, the carrying, like that's for your system. Yeah. I think it should also be long enough to put on your uh, Joy-Cons, the two controllers. Right. I think they're still there. And there's a spot for games. Okay, cool. So nice. that's, yeah. no, that, that's okay, to so me, that, that that's actually is part of that cool. package to me. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 aside from the game, obviously. But uh, but yeah, the rest of the other stuff is more sort of just strictly collectibles, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I wish... I really like the Master Sword and the flowers on it too, which they were talking about. And Reggie has kind of on uh, IGN, I think, he has a video just kind of talking about this whole set. So I really like the Master Sword. That's the reason. And I actually did pre-order this. It's 200 Canadian dollars, and I hate myself for it. That's the most I've ever spent on a video game. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> 200 Canadian dollars, 130 American. That's insane. The map, though, is really nice on the back. I don't know if they were supposed to show it off because Reggie's like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to show the front. And then the other guy kind of showed the back. On the back of the map is four creatures on the corners of the map that might be the bosses, but I don't want to ruin too much. But if you're interested, you can go check that out. So there's this version. There's also another version that's just the special edition, which is this, that I think costs, uh, it's obviously not as much as the Master Edition. This has everything except for the Master Sword in it as well. So this has everything else in it that's a lot more affordable if you're still looking at getting the carrying case or anything like that. Sorry, how um, much is that? This one, I, I do have it open on a website, so let me go back to my website and we'll just look, take a look at the prices. So here we are on GameStop of all places. The special edition is ninety nine ninety nine. It looks like so American. Yeah. Okay, okay. Hundred dollars American. Uh, the master edition is one thirty American, and the game itself sixty. Okay. So if yeah, you no, want to, not bad. So if to you want to, pretty good. Yeah, forty bucks to me. Forty dollars for all that stuff's not that bad actually. That you and get another here. another thirty bucks for the sword. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It seems that all seems pretty reasonable. Yeah, I guess that's reasonable. I mean the. The map's not much, but I think the carrying case, the CD, and the coin kind of do it. The map's pretty neat as well, but I think uh, for the sword, I, you're right. The sword's 30 bucks. That's what they're placing value for the sword. Yeah, I um, think that's that's reasonable for a collectible item. Yeah, it's just in Canadian dollars, $200. Just like, oh my God. Yeah. So much, that's a lot of money. Yep. Uh, in terms of the Switch, lastly, this is $300 for the Switch. In Canada, it's $400, but it's $300 for the Switch. I just want to get your impressions quickly. Do you think that was too much? Do you think it was the right price point? What do you guys think? To to me, for like the 400 Canadian, pretty reasonable for a console, especially something like this. That's also your you know your portable device too. It's all bundled up. That's not not too unreal. Uh, it's the peripherals that that to me are the ones that really kill you with this console. But for to me, uh, for just what you're getting, if you're playing by yourself or you're looking for a a portable, that's like a full powered console. This is going to do the job for yeah. sure. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, it was it was my understanding too that the three hundred American didn't come with anything. It just gave you the console. No game. No game. Yep. It, it does. It comes with what you see there. It got you have the the yeah. two uh, Joy Cons and the 
the holder for them or whatever that's called. Yeah, it's called the grip. The Joy-Con grip. grip. Yes, that's yeah. right. This, yeah. That Joy-Con grip, apparently, that comes with the system will not charge the Joy-Cons. The Joy-Cons will have 20 hours of charge. Uh, but if you plug them on the Switch, then they're going to be recharging on their own. So the Switch, the system itself is the tablet. The dock is called the dock. You do get the HDMI and the USB-C charging cable that will work anywhere. So $300. I'm, my main concern with it is, though, that the Xbox One and the PS4 are the same price point, sometimes cheaper right now with the game. So I, I don't know. But the Xbox uh, Scorpio is coming in, and the PlayStation 4 Pro or Plus or whatever it's going to be called is coming as well. So I don't know. I feel like 250 would have been a lot better, but 300 they can always drop. Yeah, yeah. that's true. It can always drop. And, and is there, like, is there another... Sorry, is it, pardon my ignorance here. Is there another controller... Yeah, that you can get besides that. There is. I, I remember seeing in the trailer that this guy just plugs in a switch after he gets off the airplane and, and whatnot, um, and then he just picks up a random other controller that is Joy Con yeah, grips together. The Pro. Yeah, the There's, Pro controller. Okay, that's the Pro. Okay, all right. The Pro controller has no Joy Con grips at all. Uh, I don't know if it's even listed because I couldn't find it anywhere. Yeah, I'm not seeing it listed. It looks like the. Uh, I mean, it looks like a regular okay. a regular console controller. It looks like a, an Xbox One sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I don't. Yeah, know this I see it like. now. It looks like it's going to be about seventy bucks. Yeah, actually, on Nintendo.com, you can see it, and you're right, exactly. That's the price of it. So if we go yep. to the page, it's really expensive. It's seventy dollars. So that's going to be ten more dollars than they are their counterparts, actually, for the Xbox and for the PlayStation. So it being ten extra dollars, it has HD Rumble, which uh, is interesting. Like it actually feels like there's ice cubes or there's belt ball bearings in it and they're moving around and things like that. Like it's a, it's brand new type, but $10 more than the competition is a bit of a bit of a difficult thing. So my last question for you guys is the Zelda game, something that you'd want to get on the switch or the Wii U. Both of you don't own a Wii U right now to my knowledge. Correct. No, but is like breath of the wild. If you're ever going to play it, would it be worth you buying a switch or would you just, you know, borrow someone's Wii U or does this, does breath of the wild make you want to buy a switch? It gets there for me. It, it's it's one step. The, all of the Nintendo uh, exclusives are, are usually what draw me to their consoles. The the other third party stuff usually it's not not a huge pull. But between that and the the new Mario Kart game that looks really sick, and all the other all the Nintendo the the Mario games that are always classics. The yeah, uh, having a having a Zelda game at launch is is pretty pretty key for me to buy, pick up a new system. Just like Twilight Princess, though, it's on both like the previous generation and the current. So, yeah, and I, I don't know how I don't know if I agree with that uh, with that strategy. I um, agree. I almost wish if they want to sell the console, I was fine with exactly. them just pushing it out on the Switch. Push and I have Wii U. Wii U. Yeah, exactly. You have a Wii U, but like even people that yeah, for mostly for people that do have Wii U's and are kind of on the fence about doing the Nintendo Switch, the fact that they've released um, their their main launch title on the Wii U as well, and it doesn't really entice me if I were a Wii U owner to make the okay, pun intended Switch. Yeah, exactly. Switch, right. Yeah. So I, it doesn't really it doesn't really entice me at all. It makes me just want to buy the wild for the Wii U and then wait until I see a price drop in the Switch. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I I was going to actually like when I saw the price point for it and there was pre-orders going up for the Switch and I couldn't find a pre-order. They were sold out everywhere for that time being. I was yeah. like, oh, I'll just play it on the Wii U. Yeah, like, exactly. I'll, I'll wait because it's out on both and the launch lamp's a little lackluster. But if the game's it should be a selling point of the system, but it looks like both games are almost the same. The graphics on the Switch look a little bit more vibrant. The files on both are like almost the same. Yeah, almost. like three gigs or something like that, right? Oh, uh, no, it's, it's... Oh, more than that? No, it's, I think it's like the pre-install, but both games oh, are... pre-install, okay, sorry. Yeah, both games are going to be a relatively the exact same size. Uh, size of Breath of the Wild. I thought it was 13.3 uh, gigabytes or something like that in okay. total, but we'll see about that when it finally comes out. So thank you so much for joining me on this. I think this has been a really worthwhile talk about the game, especially coming from two people that, you know, haven't played or didn't really game on the Wii U. And now maybe this system is going to be sellable or appealing to you because of Breath of the Wild. So Yeah, exactly. We've been out of the loop, out of the loop for quite a while. You know, I, obviously I moved to the Xbox and played a ton of Call of Duty and all those types of games. So maybe this will bring me back. Yeah, for absolutely. Sure. Chris, thanks so much for being on here. Uh, no hopefully you. you'll join us for the zelda -thon or something like that, maybe in a few months. For sure. Really awesome. So thanks for being here, Mike and Chris. And this will conclude this uh, episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, please ask below. This will be on YouTube. This will also be up on various podcast sites. You can ask questions there. But you can always find me on various forms of social media to ask me questions or on YouTube. So thank you so much for watching. Feel free to fill that like bucket. 